um thank you so much for joining into uh, aapti's uh, day 2 of data deliberations um aapti is a public research institute we're based in bangalore and our work explores the intersection of tech and society we are interested in research on questions of the future of workers governance and citizenship and the data economy and as we talk about the data economy we've been working on questions of data stewardship and have recently launched what we call the data economy lab along with omidya network india which is a collaborative space uh, to do some problem solving around questions of data stewardship and we hope to derive solutions to rebalance the data economy uh we also believe that responsible stewardship can unlock societal value while safeguarding the rights of individuals and communities and we see data stewards as intermediaries that lie between users data controllers and play a significant role in easing the process of sharing provide a great, providing greater control over data and also decision making to users and with that in mind today we are talking about community data and uh, you know there's a general and growing consensus that individuals uh, rights are critical but also now the fact that communities have greater say in how data is collected used and managed um you know we are also thinking of questions as collective bargaining because there's recognition that individuals are unable to negotiate with platforms so how is it that people can come together and do so um and also that our data is not just about us but it impacts a broader collective that we occupy as a people um so to discuss some of these questions of what community data is what how do we define ownership and governance uh, of data that we think belongs to the community um and what kind of sort of offline support systems we can build to ensure that um you know collective data governance can become some kind of a reality and also where we go from here we have a super exciting uh panel today uh we have with us parminder ji singh who uh is the executive director at it for change he works on has worked on icts for development internet governance and e governance for a long while he's also part of the non personal data committee Uh, by the government of india which recently released a report and we have jasmine mcneely who's also city of florida and studies law and policy and also works on private and communities and uh, is associated with Stanford Pacs. Uh, thank. Kick it off by suddenly this conversation on community data and community ownership, gathering base, and maybe Parminder, you could kick us off. Uh, can you hear me, Asta? Yes, we can now. Uh, so, so did, how did you frame the question? I just missed you uh, for a minute. No I was just saying like why is the conversation on community data okay. rights suddenly okay. gathered Okay see uh, we have uh, I mean first of all the conversation on data itself is new and it was for very good reason that initially the focus was on individual data because we were most concerned that our individual uh, private data is being uh, mined by the corporations and they are using it to man manipulate it it was also true that early on the digital economy model was based mostly on advertisement revenues and advertisement revenue is basically based on personal data so while this remains important and even central to uh, our human rights discussions what has becomes now true is uh, a couple of things one is that the digital economy is increasingly not so much dependent on advertisement but on data analytics and artificial intelligence and these feed off more on non personal data rather than personal data they are about patterns within data individual data as asta was earlier saying is in that sense not that important as how that data relates to somebody else data and what are the patterns from that data and that brings us to the question of group data uh, and when you come to the question of group data the the point then is that what is this group 
uh, how do you define that group? What are their common interests? Whether it can be called a community? And if so, uh, what is the subject of that group or community? Because to be able to exercise rights, take decisions, unless all of these have to be left to the collecting corporations who right now to take all the decisions, uh, who would be considered the subject of such data? Right now, moment data is anonymized or data is about non inanimate uh, objects. Uh, the data is completely on in uh, lawless land. There is a law around privacy in some countries, at least a lot of countries and India is trying to make a law as well. But as far as the non personal data is concerned, it's completely in a lawless land. So what we are trying to consider is that can we conceptualize that data to be belonging to a particular group and a community and there is a subject community for that particular data and that data is then called uh, community data. Uh, so, so this is the reason unless we exercise these, uh, use these kinds of concepts, we would not be able to exercise our collective rights on that data and individual rights are sometimes difficult to exercise at other times impossible to exercise because there's no individual identification with uh, that particular set of data. Asta. Yeah, and Jasmine, I know that you've also been thinking about, uh, you know, think the right of the community and also the ways in which your data is not just your own and there is, uh, you know, other people that are involved in this. And I just wanted to understand that from your experience and your work, and I particularly enjoyed the example of the ring uh, data that you had given in one of your talks. Uh, how do we think about this, uh, um, you know, as we move towards regulation uh, around community data rights? Yeah, so, well, first of all, thank you uh, for having me on this panel. And uh, I think when we think about community data, we need to think broadly. Um, who all are, who are all of the subjects that are touched or implicated by uh, data or patterns of data even, or could possibly be touched by this? So community, when we generally think about it, many of us think of geographic communities, and those are certainly definite communities, but communities go beyond just the geography. It goes into like spatial and networks and, and how people uh, move and how people um, group together. So it could be professions, it could be um, online social media groups, that's a community as well. It could be affinity groups or hobbyists that all have certain kinds of uh, commonalities or things in common but data is collected about them or data uh, implicates them with respect to how it's used, right? The kinds of inferences that can be made, the kinds of predictions that, that could possibly be made. And so when thinking about community data, it's important to think about, and, and then thinking about regulating or how we can possibly regulate it, it is really important that we think about what are all the possible ways or possible people that could be implicated uh, in this. And it could be one community for one thing and it could be another community for a totally different kind of thing, mm -hmm. but, but all of these need to be um, thought about or considered when trying to come up with some kind of regulation to either assist communities or protect communities. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, we're also joined by Anouk, who's uh, our third panelist, and she's a Mozilla fellow. Hi, Anouk. Um, and Anouk would be, you know, you've been doing a lot of thinking around, uh, you know, data as commons and also the rights of the community around that. And coming from the commons framework and thinking about the rights of the community and how it's being managed in non-data spheres, um, you know, what can we learn from the ways in which commons are managed offline uh, when it comes to community data? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, I think Jasmine made a really good point and that is that communities when it comes to data are not geographic communities per se. Um, and that's usually where I start my inquiries, like what are the boundaries of these communities? Um, and that's a bit what we learn from the uh, sort of physical world commons, uh, where the first question really is, if you are talking, for instance, about a commons around a river or a piece of land, the first question is, who belongs to this group? And is there a clear boundary? And do the people in the group actually feel like they are the members of that group? And when it comes to data, that's a lot harder. 
um, because we can think up all sorts of sort of virtual communities, uh, but do the people in them actually feel like they are part of that community? Um, and then the other thing, and that's really a big part, is like, I think often when we talk about, oh, we should have communities get rights and decide about their data, but we forget is that, yes, they are communities of people, but they're not communities of people who all have the same interests and needs and value systems. And these are diverse sets of people. And I think that's probably even more true um, when it, when we're talking about data and there is, and, and the skill usually also gets a lot bigger, right? So there's this enormous skill, which kind of automatically means you draw in a lot of people from different backgrounds and different needs. So um, while community makes us feel like we all live in the same street, that's not necessarily true. And the question then also for me is like, um, do we need to create that kind of community? Do we need to create that trust between people? Um, or is that maybe not necessary? When is it? When is it not? Like those are a lot of, I think, still open questions. Um, and then to go further into like what even is a community? Um, and this relates also to um, in the physical world, what we try to do, I think, when we create comments around, uh, for instance, a river, we try to get everyone in the group who has who is either benefiting from that resource or affected by it. So if there's a negative externality of people using the resource, ideally, the people affected by that are also part of the community. Um, and in data, often we talk about um, kind of the people the data is about or the group of people the data is about. But then there is the second question of, and just mean already um, spoke a bit about this, of like, but there is also people impacted by it, even if the just through the act of sharing, even if that data isn't even about them. Um, and you can see this really clearly in the case of an insurance scheme where healthy people may share data with their insurance provider, um, kind of saying like, look at me, I, I took a thousand steps today. I'm so great. Um, and there's a whole bunch of people who don't share data. Are they still part of the community uh, that is sharing this data, that's collecting this data about themselves? I think so, because I think they're impacted by other people, by healthy people sharing this data, because suddenly we can make inferences about them. Um, so I think, yeah, to sum up, the, com the idea of community when it comes to data is actually a really complex one that we need to unpick. No, absolutely. Parminda, you know, in your mind, uh, what, you know, these complications of what the community is, because it's not clear, it's not a geographical people, um, you know, they may be, uh, you know, part of a geographical boundary, but they may also be part of an online community. So how do we think of these overlapping communities, especially when the interests of one community may be in conflict with the other? So how do we bridge that gap in some ways? See, first of all, we need to understand that we are at a very early stage of developing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> developing a data governance framework, uh, developing a framework for the governance of a digital society. And the kind of problems Anok, Anok was saying, or even Jasmine was talking about, different kind of communities would come over. Not all of them will be able to be solved. It is possible that some communities are able to be represented in a manner and are able to exercise certain rights. It is possible that other kind of communities find it very difficult to be able to organize themselves in the same manner. And we may have to find different ways of uh, figuring out how would they uh, exercise their rights. Uh, we would also know that there would be capture of community stewardship possible and those kind of things happen. So, uh, so there would be some geographical communities. In case of geographical communities, it's easier to organize them uh, to take collective decision making. Uh, in case of communities which are linked by, say, some very uh, specific, say, a profession, we, we would, could be talking of Uber drivers uh, who are much easy to organize uh, to take those decisions. But people who use certain fitness devices uh, is, is a difficult community to capture. Now, whether as we go along, we could have online means of even having these communities being able to express their uh, decisions, collective decisions, so as to say, I know there is this concept of liquid democracy where you pass on 
your decision making capacity to somebody else for a particular subject so i think these are very difficult subjects but at least for the kind of communities where it is possible to organize collective decision making and collective bargaining uh, we should begin with it and keep it in mind that these are not the only communities and other communities are also uh, involved here right no that's super useful and jasmine i mean are there existing models of community data governance that we could be learning from uh, as we think about this because i agree like this is a very nascent field but we also know that there are some mutterings around sort of indigenous data governance and you know how do we what, what, how do we learn from existing models in some ways yeah so um there are existing models as you mentioned with uh, indigenous data governance whether that be related to health data or um, even like ethnographic or sociologically collected data as well. So just getting access to the data, there's governance schemes. So getting permission um, and having the bounds of the, the research you wanna do approved, that's a governance scheme um, that some uh, groups have set up. Also things um, like online uh, groups have you know, permission schemes is how do you access groups? How do you access certain um, platforms? I'm thinking of in, in particular, there's a platform for knitters that you have to actually join the platform to access, you know, that, that uh, group of, of folks who have come together to really focus on knitting and, and those kinds of things, which seems kind of funny, right? So knitting, but it's, a, it's actually communities and they have conversations. All of that is ripe for people to, and organizations to mine for whatever kinds of inferences that they can get from it. So people and, and organizations and groups have set up these um, um, kind of governance schemes to, and it really just depends on what they've decided is the best for them that offers them the, the most protection or um, lessens their risk of harm. And those harms can be various things. It could be, you know, trolling, right? It could be hate speech. It could be just, you know, being watched and they don't want to be watched. Um, it could also be things like uh, with indigenous languages, who gets to really have control over that language and the sacredness of that language as they see it, right? So it just really depends, but yes, there have been communities that have set up various different kinds of governance schemes, permissions, uh, all kinds of things that uh, could be useful for larger commons projects or data trusts or whatever you wanna do with those. I'm, I'm glad you brought up data trust because uh, you know that's likely to be the sort of modality through which we actualize the community data rights in some ways. And Anouk, I know that you've also been looking into various models of cooperatives and trusts and just to see uh, the ways in which the community is imagined and actualized when we're thinking about um, you know, data cooperatives in specific. Um, sorry, are you asking for an example or just an explanation? No, no, I'm just trying to understand like, you know, how they function and, and again, like their imagination of the community and the ways in which they exercise their rights. Right. Um, my expertise is slightly more in data trust, but um, in a data cooperative, essentially just in any other cooperative, um, it's owned by everyone i think is the fundamental principle and then so everyone together can make decisions about um how data is shared <clears throat> and also what data is collected in the first place which um i think is important as a distinction like we should start before there's even data collected um i was also thinking about uh, examples not just of cooperatives but commons um, and then i think agricultural data is a really good one um, it's one of those areas where the data itself is non -per is non personal because it's often about cows and crops um, and about the weather and about soil conditions and stuff like that. Um, but who gets ex who can collect that data? Who gets access to that data and how it can be used is of tremendous like the answer to those questions of tremendous importance to the farmers themselves. Um, and actually, that data can be used for a tremendously valued valuable things um, like ensuring that the right crops get uh, 
are grown in the right piece of the field where the soil conditions are best for that specific crop, which can also lead to um, a more efficient agriculture. Um, and farmers have a stake in that. They, they want that. Um, but also there's large companies that are currently producing the sensors and currently collecting all that data, uh, much in the same way that other platforms online are collecting data. Um, and so you have this question of, um, yeah, who can control it, first of all, and it looks a little similar to uh, personal data, except this time uh, the interest, the interested part is, is the farmer. Um, but simultaneously, in order to get actual value from the data, you needed it at large scale, uh, like to Parminder's point, if you want to um, actually build AI and actually um, have recommendations, kind of automated recommendations, uh, you need large data sets. Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunity there for farmers to come together and to collectively decide um, how they want to share data between themselves. It doesn't even have to go through a third party. Um, and then maybe bringing third parties to help them analyze the data, uh, but on their behalf. Um, and, and so there, and, and it's interesting because the farming, I think in farming, we already have um, a lot of experience with cooperatives. Uh, so that model is a familiar one. Um, I'm from the Netherlands and we have a lot of like our entire dairy, dairy sector is uh, cooperatively run. Um, not always in the best of ways, there's definitely some uh, downside to cooperatives, but um, yeah, so there is already this, um, this governance mechanism where all the farmers come together and make decisions about things collectively. No, that's super interesting. Um, and Parminder, I mean, the, the recent report on non-personal data, I think is one of, you know, mentions the idea of trustees and data trusts. And I, again, like, how, how do you envision the trustees engaging with the communities and also in some ways, uh, you know, representing the perspective of the community to, um, to to the regulator in the case because the 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 document talks about you know um, a certain communities can you know a, a sort of residential welfare communities can be uh, the trustees for data in that community so how, how do you envision that these trustees can work in the best interest of the community and where um, what are the sort of measures of accountability that you envision in this Okay, before I come to that question, I'll pick up from some what something what Jasmine was saying about the the indigenous communities uh, organizing their data, and then Anouk was talking about the cooperatives. And I think uh, we have to look at it in a very people insist on asking all the clarifications immediately about how you are going to do it. And right now we are at the thin side of the big wedge of deciding a new social contract. And I think as data becomes central to everything, the control over data uh, becomes a very strong uh, social force. And therefore, uh, if communities are collectively exercising this social force, we could actually be inaugurating a new form of a democracy, a very distributed kind of a democracy through these kind of uh, decision makings. And now the question which you asked about how the the techno organizational constructs of trusts come in, in between because it's easy to say that okay the decisions are being taken by the community but the fact is how are those decisions implemented is it enough to say it uh, to x company that this is my decision but how do you know that the data is being used in the manner as was decided by the community so that's where the third party concept of a trust which holds the data on a trusteeship basis uh, on the behalf of the community comes in, which would allow various value add possibilities over that data. The companies can approach, companies can give guarantees and the data can be shared securely, safely, and as per the decisions of the community. So the role of the trust is the techno organizational form. One, there is an organization which is a third party, which has the interest of the community as a principle alone in its mind and the sharing of data is done with that principle in mind. And second is the technical infrastructure of actually how sharing takes place because many of the data sharings are very complex in the digital society. We simply sometimes think that data sharing is like we'll take a box to a company and say, okay, fill my box in and then I'll take the data off. Most of 
much of important data is real time sharing you right, need real time data pipes to share that data which is a very huge complex uh, system to share data and that's where these third party institutions which are working on the behalf of the community uh, but are technically sound enough uh, who take that data and share it uh, with the with the companies who community so this is the kind of the architecture which i look at and more or less this was the architecture which the committee also looked at that's true um and jasmine like i mean what is your view of these third parties and how they sort of fit into this process of data ownership sharing empowerment more broadly yeah so i think a data trust doesn't necessarily have to be a a, a completely uninterested third party but i think uh, I, sorry, pause you there and ask you to define data trust because there's a lot of confusion in everybody's minds and everybody has their own definitions of what a data trust is. Yeah, so I, a data trust, the definition of a data trust really depends on the community who's implementing the data trust, right? So all of the things that they want, how it's governed, who controls it, will all be based on the agreement that they've come to, or at least compromise, we'll, we'll say, that they've come to with each other. And that could be that we're going to have certain, let's say, rules or certain um, agreements regarding a specific or a wide variety of data, right? That could be the agricultural data. That could be the environmental or river-based data. That could be fishery-based data. It could be data related to like um, all of the photos that we gather in this one spot, but it is a scheme or perhaps even a contract of governance that people have and related to how that data is going to be used, who can access it, things like how it's going to be secured and stored, um, things like uh, what kind of um, when the data gets deleted or if it gets deleted, um, things, considerations of is it going to be monetized and, and what kind of value uh, we're going to put on it, um, our purpose for collecting this data, kind of data or having this kind of data, and maybe our purpose for the use. But all of these kinds of things and more right, can be considered by the communities or groups of, of folks who this data pertains to or it connects to. Um, but, but this doesn't have to be an overly technical thing at all, right? So you can use technology. We have technology and technology is useful particularly for large amounts of data. But for other data, technology that it may not be as necessary or, or the kinds of technology that we're thinking of that's super um, high level is not necessary. It could be repository data, right? We can consider some of our libraries or other memory institutions as data trusts, depending on how we conceptualize those things. So I think that's important. But what, one thing that was said that I want to go back to and I think is important is that even if we're using environmental data or agricultural data and we think um, it's about cows, it's about fish, or it's about farms, there are implications for the people who are connected to those. So I think though that can be personal data, right? And that and there can be inferences made related to that data about the people in or around or connected to that. And so I think that's an important thing to to think about as well. No, that's uh, super useful and I agree. Like I mean there's elements of personal data there, I mean, the question is, is there anything such as non-personal data at all? Um, but, um, and I mean, Anouk, just on this question of like Jasmine's definition of data trust, and I wondered if you agreed with that and whether you feel like it is indeed something that, uh, you know, it depends on the communities that want to steward their data and, and come to these different rules and agreements, or is it something more top down that is embedded in, in, in a certain idea of the law and, and trust law in particular? Um, yeah, I tend to, so actually I think it's both. Um, I think what Jasmine described is a governance system. And um, when I think about a data trust, I think the governance system is the thing that everyone needs to agree on is gonna differ wildly uh, depending on what community and what kind of data you're dealing with and what kind of purpose you're dealing with. 
Um, what makes it a data trust for me is that it sits within trust law. Um, so the same law that allows rich people to put money into trust um, to siphon off to their children, like that, that kind of law. Um, and it has this neat little thing, which is a fiduciary duty. So what that means is um, once we set up that governance system and we figure out together how we want to make decisions, who is going to make the decisions, um, if there are, if at some point in that governance system, we say like, well, we have a, a number of representatives or we elect a board or to either make the decisions or execute the decisions on our behalf. Um, it's kind of nice to know that those people cannot just run off uh, with our data or do things that go against our expressed interest that we have all decided on what that is. Um, and so this bit of um, legal infrastructure would essentially allow you to say, the people we put in charge with either the decision making or the execution, those people have a fiduciary duty to only act in our interest, um, much like your doctor and your lawyer have a fiduciary duty to only act in your interest. Um, and on top of that, to not be negligent, um, which just basically means they are careful and considerate when they're dealing and making decisions and handling data. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of, I see this as a, an extra layer of protection, but it's not, it doesn't define the governance system. Um, so to give an example from the non-data world, um, it's, you could have a data commons, uh, sorry, a land commons where a, a group of people decide collectively decide about the land. And then you could also create a community land trust, which um, places the land or the land rights in the trust, and then gives a fiduciary duty to the trustees um, to govern that land in the best interest of the community. And the community can still um, have decision-making power, can still elect what should be done, but they sort of are the ultimate stewards. Um, and yeah, and if they fail to uphold their duties and um, within the purpose of the trust. So the trust could, for instance, be to make sure the land stays accessible to people with low incomes or stuff like that. Um, if they fail to to um, fulfill their duties, you can go to court and you can sue them. Um, so that's kind of a neat extra thing. Did you have another question in your question? No, that, that's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> okay, good. Um, but Bermender, like in, 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 as we think about more regulation around this, you think that this legal idea of the fiduciary duty uh, that Anouk just spoke about is critical um, to, to accountability. And without that, if it was just rule sets between people as part of a community, um, we would not be able to inculcate trust in the process of data sharing and governance? I would agree with Anouk that some kind of legal fiduciary uh, responsibility becomes more important, less privileged are the groups and the communities we are talking about. If they are privileged, if we are talking about some you know, rich communities or some companies sharing data among themselves for, uh, you know, they're, they're sharing, for example, smart car training data uh, and they develop a trust for sharing data to use that or even some rich communities uh, like the Toronto Waterfront Project. Uh, Probably they can, you know, develop rules and those rules may be enough. But I think as we, as data becomes uh, fundamental to almost all activities, we are talking of all kinds of communities, a legal framework, which provides enough flexibility. And that is important. I think the framework provides enough flexibility to have community based rules, uh, different kinds of rules for different kinds of trusts, uh, like uh, it was said earlier that Anouk said that cooperative movement has its downsides, but it also has certain frameworks within which cooperatives can be set up. So even much more flexible frameworks for data trust are needed. But I think some kind of legal fiduciary principles and frameworks are required as we talk about less privileged communities. Right. Jasmine, would you like to respond to any of the comments that were just made? No, I, I actually I, I completely agree with the fiduciary duty. Um, trust law um, 
as we as we know it has fiduciary duty but there's other aspects of law or other kinds of law that too have fiduciary duty and i'm thinking of corporation law for example and business organization law right so there's fiduciary duties in those as well i think it just really depends well first of all it depends on the jurisdiction where you create your data trust or, or co-op or whatever the case may be but i also think that it depends on how you set up whatever it is that you set up um, and which one will provide the uh, overall kind of fiduciary duty and the other protections that you want. So I don't, I, I don't disagree with the idea of fiduciary duty. I, I absolutely agree that whoever is going to be the trustee or the trustee organization must have accountability and must have that duty in place so that communities and people can get some kind of recompense when uh, it doesn't work out like they were supposed to have it work. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think, but also just to understand, like, I mean, in all of this uh, context, and this is also one of the questions that we have, is that this idea, like Parminda said, and also, you know, you said that it's very new and it needs to take some shape. But how do we move towards it and also what is the role of existing civil societies uh, organizations that may exist in uh, bringing us closer to um, you know building certain kinds of community-led community-based sort of bottom-up data trusts in some ways is this for me okay yeah no i, I think that uh, existing civil society organizations have sometimes the capacity that communities don't that can assist with organizing. Um, ultimately though, it'll be with the communities to uh, come up with their governance schemes and how they want their, their co-ops or, or um, trusts to be run. But I think civil society organizations have capacity, they have networks, and they have sometimes um, some of the uh, overhead that may be needed to, to uh, begin these kinds of things. Also, I think that there are groups and individuals who are organizing to start these. They're starting very small and they're um, convincing or persuading people that some of this needs to happen because of how data, both personal and community data and professional data, quite frankly, are being used in various ways, whether it's in the health fields, whether it's related to specific kinds of um, professions where data is increasingly becoming important or having access to data is increasingly becoming important but also as as forms of community protection we talked about a little bit about language earlier but there's other kinds of data that could be um, useful for protecting or, or at least reducing harm i'm thinking of in particular um, support groups related to um, particular um, chronic illnesses and those kinds of things, but also related to culture and, and um, religion, right? So how do people collectively unite to say, we wanna keep some of this data broadly defined um, within the community and only useful for others outside that community when they agree to comply with our kind of governance scheme or how can we use that to be beneficial to the community in so only certain ways that we've decided to allow it to be used? That's super interesting. Um, and I know just picking up on that a little bit about this ways in which the community can come together and collectively negotiate and bargain. And I also wanted to understand in your perspective, how do you think about the role of the data trust in this uh, community, bar you know, collective bargaining, for instance? Uh, right, so there's a whole lot there to unpack. Um, because it so depends on the context and specific types of data. Um, for instance, if there's a lot of personal data, um, and by personal, I don't just mean um, identifying a person, but really I know that it's data about me and I have some control over it. Um, you're gonna, I think we can expect, especially if it's sensitive and especially if it's uh, connected to a category of like, or a facet of our life that we deeply care about, like for instance, our health, we can expect individuals to take more of an active role in the decision making and like and having more control over sort of their part of the whole 
um, but there are also categories of data where it's really not about people, but it really does affect people, right? Like we've talked about how uh, even non-personal data can uh, cause harm to individuals or collectives. Um, and in those cases, I think either you have a really strong community and the community can come together and really um, among themselves decide how they want to make decisions. And for me, that's ideal. Um, but I think occasionally the either the sort of imagined community is too uh, too big and not and people in it don't necessarily strongly identify as a member of that community, um, or it's ex or it could be um, a category of data that we just we care about. Like it's a bit like I care that my Twitter data is not doesn't fall in the wrong hands, and yet at the same time, if you look at my actions, I'm doing very very little to make sure that it doesn't. Um, because it's not something that's constantly, it's not a huge part of my day-to-day -day life. Um, and I think especially in those cases, having strong trustees to make decisions on behalf of people so that we're not having to make all those decisions on our own. I think that's where it's the most important. And especially as communities get bigger and becomes harder to um, hold our representatives accountable, having that also, that extra um, fiduciary duty built in becomes really important. Um, but that's just how we enforce the things, how we make the decisions. There's so many different models. Like, um, and again, it depends on how much we care. It depends on skill. It depends on, um, like, you could imagine direct democracy type models for things where it's a smaller group of people who deeply care about the issue, but it's, it's going to work a lot harder when it's a large scale and then liquor democracy probably comes a better model where yes, as I think Perminder said before, where you pass some of the responsibility of decision making off to someone else that you deeply trust, which is a really interesting uh, model, I think. Um, so yeah, it's it's really, it's too broad a question, basically. There's just too many possible ways in which this can go. Uh, the one thing I will add, though, is that we really don't need to re be reinventing the wheel here. Um, like this trade-off between individual needs and collective needs is a trade-off that we've been making in government um, since the beginning of government. And so we, yeah, there, there's learnings there. We don't need to completely reinvent governance as a, as a discipline. No, absolutely. And I, and I agree. And, uh, you know, again, picking up on what Anouk said, Perminder, about uh, the role of the trustees in, um, you know, negotiating and, and also trying to um, take on a role which individuals may not be able or communities may not be in a position to do so. And you've been talking about, you know, the economic rights to data and the ways in which um, the value of data should be distributed. And I wondered if you see a role for, um, you know, in these intermediaries, whether they're tr data trustees, um, you know, or not, but how can they be, uh, how can they negotiate to um, find ways to distribute this economic uh, value of data across uh, communities in some ways. Okay, I'd uh, try to put it in a, a concrete example, which I shared in a keynote speech, which I gave at the ILO last year. Uh, it is about the Uber drivers and, and the way to get them economic justice today is to try to say that Uber drivers are employees of the Uber corporation and therefore they need to get some guarantees about their livelihood conditions, et cetera. And I said, let's not do that. Let's go to the opposite end and agree that Uber drivers are actual independent contractors and not employees of Uber Corporation. But then if we look at it like that, the only contract that the Uber driver had with the Uber Corporation was to that, you give me a, a commuter and I'll give you 20% cut from the fees. And that, that's done. You get me a ride and I give you the cut. But where does this data flow go? I never agreed to any data flow. So the data was always mine. Uh, now, as an individual, if an Uber driver wants to do this negotiation with the corporation that the, drive, the data was mine, so what about the data? He's not going to go anywhere. But is it possible for the Uber uh, Drivers Association, say by, say by a city, the Delhi Uber Driver Association gets together and says, that after all 80% or 70% of the value of Uber Corporation is data which is largely collected by the drivers. And by that right, we can collectively exercise rights on the data which you collect on us, whether they do it through a trust, whereby we have transparency of 
how the data is collected and how it is used. But based on that, uh, we get some negotiated rights, including maybe seats in the management, which looks like a radical situation, but the German constitution actually has provisions for workers having seats on the board. So Uber negotiates from the fact that they contribute data, which is 80% of the value of the Uber corporation to get a participation in the management of Uber itself. So that's kind of a very direct example and whether it can be transposed to other professional situations as well is the question. Oh, that's fascinating and fairly radical, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, Jasmine, coming back to um, this question of, you know, if if data trusts in are going to be able to take these radical, you know, sort of stances in some ways and renegotiate the, the way power is structured in the data economy, how do we start to think about creating trust and this is one of the questions in the from the, the attendees as well which is how do we start to create trust in data trust in the community like how do we start that process because um, I imagine that that's going to be a long one as well uh, absolutely uh, I think one of the first things that has to happen is that people need to be able to feel like they are participating and, and not just participating, just like gathering people in one room or online, but that when they participate, they are actually heard and that their concerns are actually considered in the implementation of the data trust. So if one segment of the community is saying, well, we are concerned that this other segment of the community always gets X and we are left out of those considerations. And that's something that the data trust, the organization or the community has to reckon with whatever mm -hmm. power asymmetries that are already there and then set up a trust so that those power asymmetries are not just uh, replicated within the trust. How to lose trust with people is to uh, replicate power imbalances, inequality, inequities, right, and exclusion in a, another kind of organization or, or entity, right? So that's one of the first things that has to be had. And I think prior to that, and I think Anouk talked a little bit about this, but like prior to that, there has to be some data collected on what are those, what are those social um, issues that may drive the wedge between people so that they can't come to agreements related to how a data trust, a community data trust, or whatever we want to call it, is going to be run. How, what, are, what are those issues that are large-scale disagreements? What, but, but also, what are the, the points of, of uh, perhaps cohesion where people can come together on agreement, right? So those are things that have to be decided beforehand. And then when um, all of this is happening, governance structure is being cr created, um, um, how you want to run the trust is being created. All of those people in the community need to have, or at least feel like they have a voice, but they should have a voice. And not in an extractive manner, but in a manner where they're fully engaged in the creation of this thing that's going to, um, for the most part, supposed to represent their, their interests in, in various ways. No, absolutely. And as we think about the roles of different stakeholders, there's the community, obviously, but there's also the government. And Anouk, I wondered if you had thoughts on, you know, what is the role that the government can play as we think about actualizing some of these questions around data trust and community data? In right. Um, yeah. So I think if you look at um, actual natural resource communities and the commons, so let's go back to that river and the commons around that river. Um, what research has shown, and specifically by Eleanor Ostrom, is that in order for that to work, it needs to be seen as legitimate. And for order, in order for it to be seen as legitimate, either the community needs to have collectively needs to hold the rights over that resource, or some government body needs to say, yes, you get to decide about, so which again is sort of a right, like the right to decide and make decisions about that resource. Um, and similarly with our data. So in a lot of ways, our personal data protection gives us some of these rights to say, hey, Facebook, hey, Google, you can do this. We get to make decisions about how we want this to be done. Um, but for the moment, that's still, those rights only uh, are about a subset of data 
and um, our agency over the data is also still um, quite limited, um, but it doesn't yet talk about rights over non-personal data. It doesn't yet talk about rights that groups can have rather than individuals over that data. Um, and of course, um, the Indian government is now working on this and thinking through this, which is really exciting because to my knowledge, that's the first time any government has done that. Um, but I think we, yeah, we need more of those types of discussions and, and need other governments to start thinking along those lines as well. Um, because otherwise what I'm afraid of is that, um, let's say those farmers do come together and do start to say, look, we have decided um, we want to make this, we, we want to analyze this data for this purpose. First of all, they need to be able to access their data, which right now they don't always have a legal right to do. Um, they may, the companies may be nice and maybe like, oh, well, you don't really have a right, but here is it anyway, here it is anyway. But uh, obviously that's not a guarantee that that will happen, go, continue to happen in the future. Um, and then by having those rights also that allows for having things like data trustees with fiduciary duties, because suddenly you can say, well, you can hold my rights for a little, for a little while. I'm going to give you, give them to you for a little bit to safeguard, um, but I can always take them back. Um, so I think that's a role that our governments could definitely play. Definitely. And Perminder, as we think about this, like, I mean, you know, one of the things that the NPD report has proposed is an NPD, you know, data authority. And, you know, if we're thinking about community data as something that sort of is in bottom up and in, in, in almost in agreements between the people of the community, then how do we imagine the role of the, the, the regulator in this? Uh, as Anuk was saying that, you know, it's okay for the big corporations at some times to say, okay, there's a disaster, there's flood situation in Chennai and we are going to share so-and-so data or whether there's a COVID issue and then we can share some mobility data. But that's never going to be enough. The decision has to be to, for a, with a farmer's cooperative or Chennai residents or, or any professional group to be able to do what they want to do with data. And that would, as we earlier discussed, require some kind of a legal framework. And when you require a legal framework, you, when you have a legal framework, either the executive decides it or an independent regulatory body decides it. And we, we are not only, and I, I mean, the report has asked for an independent regulatory body, but I personally feel that both this regulatory body and the personal data body should be constitutional authorities. They should completely be uh, at uh, arm's length from the executive because only a constitutional body can decide on things uh, which are of such importance that even the state may be interfering in them. So the role of the authority, I think, is important. I don't know, the word authority never looks good. You know, you could say something more good sounding, but basically a regulator, I mean, you can just call it a regulator perhaps, but a regulator is needed to come in and say, well, no, these farmers do have this right and they are exercising it in a right manner. Or, or on the other side, and this was a point I was about to say, and the question which was asked in the, uh, the Q&A was how trust is created. The trusts are also liable to be captured. We know that cooperative movement has been captured politically at many places and how it's hyper politicization itself may not be at all be working for the interest of those it uh, seems to protect. So what are the avenues available for a community member to therefore represent that this is not working these kind of possibilities can only be dealt by a regulator, whether you call it authority or whatever. So I think a regulator is, is important and it will become more important as we go forward. I hope it becomes a constitutional body. It will have more variegated uh, departments to be able to deal with many kinds of problems that we have mentioned here. No, absolutely. But I think like, one of the questions that's at the, at the heart of it is as we you know regulate data more and more um it's the age-old question of you know what is the best metaphor and as we think of it as you know as commons and and the the likeliest metaphor then becomes is data property is it an asset and i wondered uh you know what everybody's thoughts were and maybe jasmine you can kick it off like is data property 
Uh, I would say no, that is not property. Um, and, and here's why, because property and propertyized um, frameworks allow for things like Parminder said, and that's capture or being taken away. So there are schemes like imminent domain and other schemes whereby someone can lose their property or have it taken away, of course, at, at for sometimes, sometimes for value, right? But still, it's no longer theirs. And so then what do you have if you've created this data collective, this data cooperative, particularly with very sensitive data? And government swoops in and says, well, we need this for the public good or public interest. Now you no longer have the entity that you thought you had created to um, actually uh, promote your interest or work in your interest, right? Because now it's, it's that data is uh, in the possession or under the control of government. Also think about if we look and analogize data to land property, there are certain things that even if you have land, you just can't do on your land you're not allowed to, right? So there are rules and regulations with real property and, and intellectual property as well that would shape how we view data. And I don't think we want those kinds of, those same kinds of rules because of the nature of data. Instead, I would, I would promote, and I have been promoting in a different idea, and that is that data is a representation. It's a, it's a representation. And many times when it's, when it's, dealing with the personal, it is a representation of the human. Therefore, then, if, if we're talking about things that are captured, do we allow humans to get captured in certain ways? I mean, we think about it with uh, people doing illegal stuff, sure, right? But usually us just walking around normally, we're not supposed to be captured. So that means that there's a different kind of thinking or framework that organizations, whether they are civil society, or government or corporate organizations must have and a duty to us then also an underlying duty to not do certain things to us if we change the way we think about data and connect it more with the person or the community than we do if we connect it more with property a, a kind of thing that can be bought or sold traded uh you can be you know regulated what you can do with it those kinds of yeah, no, absolutely. And Parminda, in the example that you gave about the Uber driver and the data trust and some of those, uh, you know, ways, oftentimes data is interpreted as labor because it allows, you know, it's a result of the work that we do online and it's being generated. And, and when we think of communities, do you think that if property is not the right uh, analogy, then is labor, data is labor? Yeah, actually, I've done a paper for Public Service International where I spent two or three paragraphs trying to compare this and then concluded that it is not labor. Uh, with labor, basically, you rent your labor. Uh, if you are making, say, plastic chairs, the labor is needed again and again to make that plastic chairs. So you are renting the labor and therefore you'll keep on getting remuneration because labor is always needed. But data, once you give it away, is power forever. That data is not needed again from you because you have given that data away. New kinds of data may be needed, but that data is not needed. And that data would possibly be used to replace you because the data you have given is perhaps how to make chairs. Uh, and, and once the data is captured adequately, then it is used to replace you. So unlike labor, which is required every time in an instance of production, the data which you give, every time you give data, that data is forever. Its value is used at every instant of production without you being needed to be there. You may be asked to give new kinds of data, but not the same data. So there, there, is, there is a big difference uh, between the two. And I think uh, Jasmine was right. You know, uh, We are looking for one metaphor because this looks like a new thing, but data be would become everything. It's like a mirror. And with a mirror, you can't blame the mirror for the metaphor. The mirror is what is there in the mirror. If there is labor in the mirror, then it's labor. If it is resource in the mirror, it's resource. If it's property property in the mirror, it's property. So it's, it's basically a representation. That's the word used by Jasmine. And therefore, it's all the different kind of things. But I think resource word should not, some people try to use the resource word in a negative manner. But I don't think resource is a negative word. Even social capital is a resource. 
friendliness is a resource if i know a lot of people that's a resource these are not negative resources these are things we use to uh, you know i mean go along with our lives so data can be used in many different ways to expand the possibilities of our lives the resource is anything which expands the possibilities of life and therefore resource word is not a bad word property word is also elinor ostrom uses the word common property rights for even commons so commercial is different from property and economics and resource and commercial is a problem where you can sell buy put a price to everything the highest bidder can take it that that word is a problem but i think other words are not a problem but none of these words completely captures the meaning of data and it's like we can keep on trying to put different lights on the concept of data from different sides but data is everything in the world perfect anuk i mean what is your favorite metaphor i guess is it property is it resource <laughs> if it's ostrom then is it correct like where do we go from here and again as we think about it from the perspective of the community in particular yeah um there's so many um i think oil is a particularly bad one like basically whatever metaphor we choose and i agree with perminder here mostly reflects who how we see the world um when we talk about data as oil we tend to see things that can be extracted uh when we talk about data as labor we tend to be people who fight for labor rights like it's 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 very much in the eye of the beholder um i think on the question of is data a thing to be owned i think data can be a thing and whether things are things is very much a legal question right it's very much a we often create things by writing laws like by creating by writing intellectual property right laws we are creating things that previously weren't in the legal sense of things and we could do the same thing with data we could make data ownable um for me the question is should we and the answer is no um but for me they're just uh, talked about Ostrom and uh, Ostrom's are different ideas of property and I think it's really relevant um, because basically what she did is look at property not as one thing uh, that can be owned but as a thing that can we have we can have rights over uh, and those rights range from the rights to access a thing the right to extract value from a thing um, and then we have the rights to allow to determine who else gets access as well as the right to determine who else can withdraw uh, value from the thing and then finally there's the right to alienate all your rights um so let's say i have rights over a house um i usually also have the right if i'm not renting but i own the house you could say i have the right to alienate all my rights over the house which is a very complicated way of saying i can sell my house um and i think when it comes to data we want to have right to access our data use our data and but also the rights to determine who else can do those things but we should never be able to alienate our rights that's like I saying i can alienate my human rights i know if i sorry parmin sorry i'm sorry but one of the rights is also to not have outsiders have rights on it to disallow right, outsiders to exclude, having, right so that would be the right, right to, to access also, and this uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So the right to decide who has access and the right to decide who can use is alternatively you can see it as the right to exclude people from access and exclude people from use. Um and those are reflect a lot of the rights we get under uh data protection laws. Um but we shouldn't be able to alienate them. Um in my view we should occasionally be able to say hey this person is going to make some decisions on my behalf. And so but that's not alienation like I still have the rights. I can never sell data and then suddenly Uh, the government can decide who can access it and who can use it and it's no longer my decision so i think there's that's where the distinction lies perfect that was uh, fascinating i'm just going to jump into some of the questions that we have here and i can just uh, you know throw them out and everybody can possibly respond so one of them is and something that we've touched upon a little bit is that hierarchies exist within communities too and i guess communities as they exist in their offline versions are unequal so how do we make sure that data trust can help um you know navigate some of these power asymmetries especially since trusts will likely be representations of that community um uh, maybe i can start with jasmine and then uh you know go to parminder and anuk yeah no i think we we kind of discussed this a little bit earlier recognizing that there are power asymmetries from the 
the the inception of even wanting to have a, a a data trust is a really important thing but then finding out what those are is also important so communities are made up of sub communities as well and so what are the sub communities what are what is what is their um station or what what it, what is happening with them what are their concerns it needs to be one of the um, primary focuses of a data trust because any way you use data that is representing the community is going to have attachments to it and those attachments are are in the social or in the political or in the environmental right and so understanding those attachments is going to be really important for whoever the trustee is or the organization that's that's set up to um, run the, the data trust so to speak understanding those then and coming up with a uh, scheme or a way of utilizing the trust that does not replicate those power asymmetries or those concerns is going to be really important because you're not going to be able to get people to participate or to continue to participate with a trust if they feel like their concerns are not being heard with any organization if they feel like their concerns are not being heard so while they may have capture with certain data in the beginning towards the end they're not going to participate anymore because they feel excluded from decision making or that what do they need this for it's just another organization that is continuing to have not my necessarily my best interests at heart so those are considerations that have to be um, considered before even the inception of the trust that um, I think this is one of the reasons it's a good thing that a trust be kind of local, so to speak, or have knowledge of that community or communities, because mm -hmm. then they'll have the competence, so to speak, to navigate those kind of dynamics that are happening, or at least understand them better than an outside organization would. Um, but those understanding those things will be paramount importance from the beginning, even at the idea stage, understanding what are the issues and what are the dynamics between sub communities in a community. No, absolutely. Um, Praminder, what are your thoughts on this? Like, how do we sort of navigate out of these uh, dynamics in a certain way? How do we account for them? And how do we make sure that our data trusts um, in some ways rise above them? See, this is a very fundamental question of democracy. How do we enable people to be able to decide about their lives? And as we have been talking, as data becomes a part of agriculture, it parts of animal husbandry, it's part of, part of education, local primary health center, everything is data-based. Then data-based decisions become one of the biggest expressions of democracy. And we have to go along with the so-called inefficiencies of democracies, but the beautiful of the participativeness of democracy. And that's where the real political economy question will come. There are a lot of people who are impatient to you know, just run away with the data and say, what, what, what's wrong with you guys? Why are you even talking all these kinds of things? We can show you so many wonders with data and you're getting all these messy questions about who will decide and where is the sub hierarchy and where the lower hierarchy has interacted with the higher hierarchies. And we need to be able to say, no, that's how we will run our world. And that's the decision, that's the overall framework, social contract decision which we have to take that no, we would our world to be messy like a democracy. We will run our data systems in a messy manner. I mean, we would have them as efficient as possible, but we don't want you to say that, well, you know, if you don't do all these kind of things, we can show you great wonders, which is being done right now to us. You know, every time we net get a new model of uh, Galaxy or an Android phone or something, everybody tells you, you just keep shut and we'll be giving you the goodies. At one point, the world has to say, no, stop it. We have understood what is possible, but we will control our data and through our data, we will control our democracies. And I keep on thinking that data controls will be a big part of democratic controls. And within this, I completely agree with what Jasmine was describing, but over that, I wanted to lay this overall idea that yes, it will be messy, it will be inefficient, but that's the way we want to go forward. And Anouk, where do you stand on the messiness of data trusts and how that like friction between efficiency and in some ways uh, democratic functioning is? Yeah, no, I agree with both Jasmine and Perminder. Um, and just to, I think 
also given the way their our world operates right now where efficiency is the holy grail of everything my kind of gut sense is like let's throw a whole bunch of messiness in there just let's slow down that process a little bit of because it when you slow it down you actually give people a chance to figure out what they think and voice their concerns so yeah let's have all the messiness um i think one more complication is that while you have hierarchy within communities and lots of different opinions and voices and needs within communities obviously those also exist between communities um and i'm always thinking about things like trade unions and how they create kind of an insider outsider effect uh where the people represent who have jobs who are represented by the trade union have an advantage over the people who want to who are looking for jobs and may actually make it harder for people to find jobs like those kind of dynamics also also happen when you talk about data communities um what is to stop a community from and this you see this in the cooperative world as well like what is it sounds really nice but um a bunch of a group of people can still get together and do evil things together like just because everyone has a vote doesn't mean they will suddenly only do great things so um yeah also conflicts between communities and hierarchies between communities is a whole different just to complicate things further because it was so simple before wonderful uh i'm gonna read out a question that we have in the chat uh and maybe again we can maybe just everybody can weigh in if data is not an expendable resource and that it does not get finished or over on being shared then is alienation of rights over data even possible does selling my data to someone also result in the relinquishing of my right over that over that data or is it really a matter of what's decided in that data sharing contractual agreement between the two parties where a person says i can relinquish my right over this data or not and won't this differ for personal and non personal data um per yeah uh, okay so it was a complex question and i think i'll try to answer some parts of it as only some kinds of rights over data should be non alienable second i do not believe that data is completely a non rival resource data and network effects are combined they work together if i already have a network i have a mine i may as well have a mine and i can tell you oh you can also go and mine oil but you don't have no ways to dig down 500 feet from the ground and do the mining so the rivalness comes from the fact that network and data work together so so data is a rival resource uh and therefore controls over data are are important that 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 that's the main thing uh, it may be different from npd and personal data because many of the personal data we should not be able to as jasmine was saying uh, should not be able to alienate our rights over most of that uh, npd data may be sometimes of a different kind uh, in many cases even there the non alienation of right would work because it is uh, connected to the way of living of the community and is intrinsic to their community life but other kinds of data may be a little more expendable and alienable uh, so yeah so the question does draw out a very good landscape of the issues on most of it i think the issues are important that's what i would answer it with jasmine what do you think yeah so i think it it the from a legal perspective it depends and one of the things it depends on is the jurisdiction that you're under so i'm thinking of gdpr for example even if you share data or or an organization has collected data about you that doesn't mean you lose all manner of ability to um uh, assert privileges or or control over your data um of course we we've heard about right to be forgotten but there's other kinds of ways that you can assert um um certain kinds of controls or uh privileges according to the law over your data uh even in the United States you can uh ask for certain things related to your data um from certain entities or certain organizations right So it really just depends. And I say GDPR, I say in the US, but there are various other countries and and regions that have certain kinds of of laws and um uh, regulations in place where people can um ask for certain things and have a organization have to comply within certain amounts of time. Um it it really 
you know, the legal answer is it depends on what kind of uh, scheme you're under. Um, I would say though that it, it's important for us not to think solely on the individual sharing um, mm -hmm. because for, for most, for the most part, when we as individuals share, already there is a power dynamic at play that the organization has way more power than we ever could have, unless we're, we are Bill Gates or, uh, you know, whoever else, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, right? There's already a power dynamic in play wherein that organization has way more control, way more ability to do certain things with data than we could ever. So it's important not to think on the individual level, but to think like how, how can best perhaps a regulation or a law help to protect us in these exchanges? Because mm -hmm. there is that uh, um, power dynamic at play, what makes it really hard for us to ever be able to assert any kind of true control or rights to data that's connected to us. Oh. Makes sense. Um, another question we have, and Anouk, maybe I can bring you in here, is about the sort of enforceability of the fiduciary duty and how do we locate, you know, the fiduciary responsibility that trust might have towards people in also the sort of realities of the justice system, which is, you know, accessibility to the justice system, rule of law, enforceability. How do, how do these two aspects interface? Because there could be a notional fiduciary duty, but what does that really look like? Right. I mean, that's a really, really good question. First of all, I don't think any kind of governance arrangement and including the legal arrangement should ever fully only depend on the fiduciary duty, right? Like you, you wouldn't put someone in charge of your data who you fully don't trust and then rely only on the fiduciary duty to keep them um, in line. That's, that, that's just a bad idea. So it's complementary, first of all. Um, secondly, one of the good things about trust law is that rich people use it to put their money in. Um, so it's a fairly well protected piece of uh, law. It's like, um, we want those fiduciary duties to be strong and they are uh, usually well upheld with courts. Um, but that still doesn't answer your question about um, access to justice. Um, and it's a really good one. Like that we need to have the resources to even bring those um, those court cases. Um, and I think that would be more likely in a data trust with kind of a mixed participation where you have people with those resources because then they can start doing that on behalf of the entire group. Um, another thing that could complicate uh, the enforceability of fiduciary duties is when the purpose of the trust is not that clear because um, yes, trustees have this duty of loyalty, but they have that within the context of the purpose. So if it's not really clear what they're supposed to be doing, then it's hard to hold them accountable for whatever it is they do. Um, and the other one is uh, there are types of trust, especially in the US, where you don't have clearly defined beneficiaries. Um, and these are often like seen as charitable trust, for instance. So you could say the purpose of the trust is to cure cancer. We're going to collect, uh, like we're going to manage data with that purpose in mind. Um, but there's no, the beneficiary is such a broad group, which is basically everyone in the world who could possibly ever get this type of cancer, that we're not gonna define it, we're just gonna set the purpose. Um, and then the question becomes, who are the people who are gonna actually do the suing, who are gonna feel like they're enough of a stake and skin in the game to actually do the suing? I don't have an answer, I'm just complicating the question more, but um, those are very valid concerns, I think. Perfect. Uh, I'll take one last question as well, which is maybe for everybody and we can kick it off with Parminder. Uh, do you think that the creation of the community would necessarily involve tech solutions? And I'm coming from the idea that me data, which is a data cooperative for personal data and the people who sign up become members of the cooperative. So there's a technology or an app that facilitates the building of the community. And we go back to where we started in some ways of you know, what is the community and how do we define it? Could this be a way of both mobilizing communities and also resolving community conflicts and to the idea of what Anouk was saying is having very specified data, you know, stewards that you can sign up for in some ways? I take the question to be, uh, I am aware of the my data's uh, work, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. The question to be application versus trust. 
are technical applications more or less enough to do the kind of things we are talking about or mm-hmm. do we need legal techno structures uh, and i think uh, in any case and my personal belief is that even for personal data management and even my data would beyond a point beyond an application need certain techno structures uh, also but definitely for non personal data which is uh, oops is he frozen sorry yeah okay uh all right jasmine do you want to just uh, maybe pick up on that while perminder unfreezes sure um i think it, you know apps and uh, technical ability is really good for certain kinds of data for other kinds of data you may not need the digital technology that we i think we've been talking about for a long time but um and in the case of my data where people join and become mm-hmm. a part of the cooperative i think the issue with something like that not that it's a bad thing but the mm-hmm. issue with that is that the trust is not coming or the co-op is not being created by the community so the tr- mm-hmm. so the so the app and the technical a organization has its own goals and its own already set up um ideas about how something should be run what the rules mm-hmm. are the community guidelines the community regulations how how data can be accessed and stored and all those things that people just joining didn't have necessarily a hand in uh, being a part of creating those goals those purposes right and so that's something to consider like you you may want to join because it's it's great and it it suits your purposes but you didn't have a hand in creating that governance scheme and and those purposes in the first place and so that might be something that might either be a turn off for folks or it might be something that people don't even you know care about but it's not necess- it's a community but it's not a community led or community initiated data trust or data co-op which i think is an important distinction to to make absolutely opermen oh, is back but i will uh, you know take the liberty as the chair to ask one last question of everybody and uh, permin i'm sorry you dropped off earlier so jasmine picked up on the question but um, maybe start with anoop so what is the next one year look like for uh, you know building data trust in 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 the world oh wow um for me I, like so when it's really about data trust there's a legal component to figure out which is that part where we say hey these are my data rights can you take care of them for a little bit are we even allowed to do that that's the question i'm currently working on uh but more broadly i think actually piloting these things and not in a let's figure out if it could be possible but actually getting groups of people together which i think it really starts with getting people in a room and trying to figure out what are the different needs and interests around a specific issue and and take it from there and build very very tailored solutions for those problems um and then once we do that a thousand times maybe we can start to generalize um but yeah right now we're doing a lot of generalizing um but we need to know what are the specific because once you start doing that things are going to come up that you never imagined would so i think for yeah. me that's the next year for sure perminder what do you think where do we what is the next year in this conversation look like i think i exactly agree with anok anup that the two aspects one is the legal aspect one is the piloting aspect i think more countries should start putting in place a framework under which a very light touch framework uh, both the pilots and the legal side should recognize that we are in it for a long haul so this mm-hmm. early saying and i have seen them say to the npd report i've seen them see to say to the pilots which are done no this is not working this is not going to work we are talking about many many decades to come this is not one of those you know small uh, college experiments so and knowing that this is a long haul we develop framework laws under which it becomes possible to do a lot of trust uh, development and within that do a lot of pilots of communities of a big campus i was talking to iit mumbai that c- can we have the campus of iit mumbai is a consumer data and the local shopkeepers can can we develop a community trust between uh, among them so do a lot of these experiments i think a combination of the two is what this next year should be seeing 
Right. So Jasmine, it seems we're not overhauling the data economy in the last next one year. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, we may not be overhauling it, but I think we can make uh, clear revisions to how uh, data is being used. I think that there are regulations or, or legislation in various countries that are uh, either in the proposal stage or in the consideration stage, which may be useful in thinking about data and, and the duties of organizations, whether they're data trusts or just corporate or civil society organizations to uh, regular folks with regard to data and how they use it and, and whether they collect it or not. But I also think that um, true consideration of how data can be helpful and harmful to different communities and people needs to uh, continue to be uh, uh, ramped up and, and um, those harms, we need some form or some ways to uh, rethink um, how uh, data is used so to mitigate harm or to stop harm altogether. No, perfect. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a scintillating uh, conversation. I'm so glad to have been a part of it in some ways and listen to everybody. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to the panelists and everybody who attended.